Women have played a really important part in the history of Pinehurst. From Annie Oakley's shooting lessons to champions including Babe Zaharis and Peggy Kirk Bell, today we are talking with someone who is paving her own path as a woman making history at Pinehurst. Thanks for joining us today here at the Business of Golf. Welcome into the Business of Golf. I am Allison Johnson and I'm here with Adam Grubb. Adam, I want to talk caddies today and I'm curious about you on the course. What are your preferences? Are you cart? Are you caddy? Are you four caddy? What's, the, what's your scoop? Any chance I have an opportunity to have a caddy, a uh, four caddy or a uh, carry caddy, I, I do. I love the experience. I, they are extremely helpful. I love the, the stories and the conversation that I get when, when I'm playing with them. But truly, uh, as you very well know, I need all the help I can possibly get. And so to have someone helping me through that is, is great. But I, I love I also how, how important I feel. Um, I feel, feel very cool when, uh, when I have a caddy. So, yeah, I'm, I'm caddy all day if I, can, if I can do it. Makes you feel legit, huh? I get it. I get it. It made me feel like a fraud the first time I had a caddy, but now I enjoy it. And I enjoyed it even more recently at Pinehurst when I was there for the Lily, the first of now an annual women's golf outing, and I got to meet Rose Thurman. Uh, Rose, I am so excited that you're here today. Rose was, happenstance, the woman I played with was like, oh, I got a caddy. I'm like, okay, great. She was like, it's a woman. And I was like, get the hell out of here. This is amazing, right? So up comes Rose, and she's all happy and positive, and I'm thinking this is going to be a good day. So Rose, thank you. Welcome, for, welcome to joining us, and we're just so excited that you're here. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And it was a pleasure taking care of y'all at Pinehurst. And um, I'm excited, you know, to hear your questions. Well, good, good, good. We're excited too. So why don't you just start off by telling us a little bit about your background in golf when you started and how you got into caddying. Okay, so I actually um, used to work in the hotel industry. My degree is concentrated in hotel management. And I checked in the players in the PGA Tour in 2017 and in 2018. And that's the Valero Texas Open specifically at TPC San Antonio. And I checked in the players both years, had some, you know, experiences where, you know, it's so busy for those players that some of them are in passing, you know, some of them might kind of make you feel like you're less than sometimes and sometimes they're really nice, but the most like wonderful person I ever met on the PGA tour was in 2018. And that was Peter Malnati. Him and his wife were so kind and wonderful. And uh, they asked me like, hey, are you interested in golf? Have you ever been out there? And I said, no, golf is rather boring. I said to the man who dedicated his career <laughs> to this sport. And um, which is kind of funny in hindsight now that I'm in love with the sport, but um, he's like, well, you ought to go out there and just check out what it's all about. So I went out to the Valero Texas Open for the last day in 2018, fell in love, and my ADHD loves it. You can walk with the player that, you know, you is in first place and see if they're how they're doing. You can intimately hear them talking to their caddy, or you can follow Peter Malnati, who was so wonderful and nice and kind. I wanted to support him, and I followed him for a few holes, experienced his highs and experienced his lows. Or you could sit on the hardest hole in the entire course and watch everybody miss it. So my ADHD, I, I love sports, but sitting in the stands gets me restless. And so I liked that part of golf. And I was like, this is awesome. Went to the driving range every day for three months after that. That was my first introduction to golf. Didn't know a lick about it before that. And, um, you know, as my husband is in the army, so we moved around quite a bit. We lived in four states within 12 months. And the last destination was North Carolina. And to be an hour away from Pinehurst, that's just incredible. So I was able to look into opportunities that Pinehurst had and I became a caddy. And now, I mean, anything that I hadn't learned in a book or a video prior to coming here, I learned on that course. And now I would say I'm a fantastic green reader. I'm a fantastic line giver and definitely encourager on the golf course for the the mental game. So let me just make sure I have this uh, timeline right, Rose. You, uh, two years ago, three years ago, uh, thought golf was boring, and now you are caddying for, uh, at one of the most pre uh, prestigious courses in all of our lands, and a, a course where most people would, would pay and do pay uh, a lot of money to play. You're now caddying and telling people, hey, here's the experience at Pinehurst. That's quite a quick story, an overnight story, 
but uh, yeah. it's it's so it's so great to hear how quickly you fell in love with the game. How quickly have you fallen in love with with the job and the effort of caddying? Um, even more. And what's funny is my first job that I applied for at Pinehurst was not as a caddy because I work for Caddy Master. We take care of Pebble Beach, Whistling Straits, Kiowa, Augusta National, and Pinehurst. So I could, if we were to get stationed somewhere else, work for another golf course. Um, but particularly um, at you know at Pinehurst, uh, I. I thought I was going to be in bag drop. Like I was trying to apply at Pinehurst for bag drop and I hadn't gotten any phone calls back and everything thinking that I was going to learn something about golf from bag drop, which I realized in hindsight, that's not, not the case. And because I hadn't gotten that phone call back, um, quite, you know, as quickly as I wanted, I went and applied for caddy master, which, uh, you know, handles the caddies at Pinehurst and got a quick call response and answered some basic questions about golf knowledge in order for them to train me and see if I would be a good candidate as a caddy. And then from there, I learned everything. And I'm so grateful because not only did I learn so much just in the training uh, process, because Caddy Master is like one of the top in their training and their standards and the customer service side, especially, which is so important as a caddy. Um, and then I, I learned everything on the course and not a gambler, but I've learned a lot about that as well. <laughs> Lots on the golf so course. So you talk about training. Um, yeah. What is the training to become a caddy? If somebody wants to start caddying, you know, what, what is the process? Well, the basic knowledge that I had to learn in order to even apply, to get, you know, looked at to be a caddy, um, I really had to have that passion to be, because it was a year. So I started September 19th of 2019, and uh, my love for golf started April of 2018. So in a year and a half, I was reading everything I could, watching videos, kind of learning things that are only textbook that really you don't learn on. I mean, you'll learn so much more on the course, but that got me through enough for them to say, okay, this is a candidate that, candidate that we will um, consider because from there, they know that they can teach you other things. They can't teach you how to be kind or how to take care of somebody like their family and personalize their experience. And I had that background already. That's such an important part about being a caddy. So if you wanted to be a caddy, you should really have a basis in just taking care of people. Because if you are one of the people that after COVID, have, you just hate people for some reason, maybe caddying is not for you. Because um, I, think, I think it would only amplify whatever you had prior. If you are passionate about people, it's only going to increase your passion. Maybe if you're not so, um, you don't enjoy the experience of taking care of people, it's only going to worsen that, that feeling. So you're one of the only women caddies in, at Pinehurst. Um, there, there's not a lot of you, but that doesn't define you as a caddy. You're, you're, you're defined by caddy is that you are relatively new into the, into the sport, into the job. But mm -hmm. I, I can assume um, I, I, that you have had some barriers of yourself to overcome, even in that first hole, that first experience and that, that first reaction, when you go up, you say, I'm your, I'm your caddy. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and, and really where, you know, how you've handled and dealt with, I'm sure some of the eye rolls, concerns, confusion, um, all of that. Um, so I'm a very friendly person. So thankfully I've only ever had two issues on the golf course in the year and a half or so that I've been at Pinehurst. Um, in the beginning when I was still nervous because you know I wasn't, I was still learning about reading putts and I was only getting like 50% of my putts right in the very, very beginning, I was so nervous. And that being nervous might make that person doubt that ability right off the bat. And so as I got better, I got more confident. And now it's never an issue where somebody's like, oh, you're gonna carry my bag. If anything, they look down because 95% of the um, caddying I do is double bagging. And it's seven miles with approximately 70 pounds. And so the first look I'll always get is like, you gonna be okay with my bag? And I prove pretty quickly that that's not a concern at all, um, as long as they're okay with me carrying the bag. Because sometimes you'll have like, somebody might feel bad and at first they don't really realize that you're capable of doing what you're about to do and so they might carry their bag like you know either being a gentleman like how could a lady who's like 100 pounds less than me 
carry my bag like seven miles. And so sometimes you have to reassure them that confidence that I got after I became, you know, 95% of my reads being correct, 99% of my reads being correct. Once I got there, then the confidence by itself reassures the player. That's really important for all caddies. Like the fake it till you make it's very true just because you have to, you have to in, like reassure your player that you're going to take care of them through and through and that they don't have to worry about a thing and that if anything, you're worried about their confidence and their ability because they are about to play Donald Ross's like torture course. Like on the third green of Pinehurst, he used to sit on his porch and if somebody made a birdie, he'd come out and cut a new cup to make it harder. So, <laughs> I'm, I mean, don't worry about me. I'm more worried about you <laughs> as I carry your bag down one of the hardest courses um, and the most historical course in the U.S. Well, I have to say it was the most fun I've ever had with a caddy. I mean, <laughs> I've, I don't typically talk a whole lot with my caddy. And so it was just, it added to the entire experience. And we had such a great time. I requested her the second day because I was like, wait, I want her. Make sure I get her because we had such a great time. Um, we were probably one of the few groups that requested a caddy, I think, a lot of that had to do with the fact that a lot of the women there don't play regularly. Um, one of the things I'm asked most when I do my beginner clinics, um, I do not coach them. We always have a PGA of America instructor with us, but I host them and talk about the business side of golf. One of the biggest questions I get is, what do I pay my caddy? I don't know how to do it. You know, it feels awkward. And so talk to me a little bit about what advice do you give people who don't, who aren't used to playing with caddies when it comes um, to tipping and paying and that kind of stuff. Absolutely. So um, when you first come to a course, the first thing you want to do is when you check in for your tea time, you want to ask what their minimum recommended amount is. So for Pinehurst at, right now, I think they're transitioning right now from $40 per bag while carrying. Um, they're transitioning to be $50 per bag while carrying. Um, if you were to go to a course and they had a minimum recommended amount, that is the, the minimum required amount. <laughs> so that's a good baseline. You start there and then you say, what kind of service did I receive? How did they do? Um, you know, think about, think about that whole environment around that of like, wow, that was a, a great experience. And then from there, I would say it's typical for people to do 100% more than the minimum recommended amount or 50% um, more than minimum recommended amount. That's really common and I think that's a really good baseline. And then I kind of joked earlier too about how uh, you could adjust that for inflation because obviously every year is gonna be a little bit different. And sometimes I talk to past caddies who had a different baseline. And so we're just talking about right now and right now, you know, take that minimum recommended amount and consider your experience and when you look at your experience you don't you probably don't want to give minimum recommended but you probably want to start at like 50 percent more than minimum recommended per bag and then go up from your experience and and buy them a drink or a snack too i mean let's be honest here right I, that that's should, in my opinion you should never hold back on taking care of your caddy out there and it has nothing to do with us being greedy it's because we're physically exerting our bodies and we need to stay hydrated, we need to eat food, and it's gonna only help us, you know, take care of you on the course. I think I spent so, $50. I, get one, I, think, I think I spent $50 one weekend just on chili for my caddy up at uh, Sand Valley. <laughs> just chili, $50, <laughs> just in chili. Well, I, I don't recommend, if you're a caddy out there, I don't recommend eating chili on the course because if you're physically That's exerting insane. yourself, it's gonna come right back up. <laughs> so. he, he was conditioned for it, uh, for sure. <laughs> Rose. <laughs> Rose, what, uh, what do you think about the caddy uh, situation currently in golf? And, and where do you think it could go, should go? Um, because it is employment. It is bringing new people into the game, like yourself. Uh, where do you think the caddy style and, and, and that position itself in golf should go in the next few years? Um, in the next few years, um, I think it should become, I mean, I feel like it's already quite a respected position. And I feel like, you know, given the fact that caddies can make pretty good money, given what we do, the fact that we may only work five hours in a day, unless we double loop and it's like a 10 hour day, 
and um, it's kind of going into a point where people are dedicating their lives to be a caddy and any career would need kind of benefits on the back end, you know, medical benefits or other types of benefits. I don't think across the board that medical benefits are offered nearly enough for caddies. And the only reason that that touches base for me is because we've had many caddies that have been there 50 plus years who have either gotten cancer or had um, other medical needs come up that weren't always provided for unless they had a private option uh, covering you know themselves or their families. And I'm fortunate enough that my husband is in the army and that um, I'm covered under that. But you know I can't say the same for my fellow colleagues. So I guess that would be you know something that we would need to consider for the future is just making sure that we are taken seriously as professionals um, and going from oh I caddied when I was 16 during the summer to these are this is my profession and transitioning because I mean you don't see you know 10 year olds out caddying during the summers anymore that that might be more of a pastime where you know before I hear people tell me all the time when I was 14 years old I went and I caddied at this golf course during the summer and it'd make me extra money and everything well, yeah, but I mean, the guys I work with, they've been working and some of them have been working in this industry 10 plus years. That's a career. I would love my 14 year old to caddy. I don't think he could pay attention for longer than like one hole. <laughs> Honestly, my stepchildren, they're nine and 10. I think all children today could use a little bit of it because I think that pain <laughs> tolerance is lower too. I, I wouldn't mind a few kids carrying a bag for a mile even just to He'd say- He'd be like, okay, do I get a cart? <laughs> I'm having well, yeah, problems. Life is not going to be pretty. <laughs> I'm having problems getting my kids to take their clothes upstairs. So I don't know how the hell right. we're anticipating them uh, carrying a bag, but uh, but that's a good a good point. <laughs> pretty accurate. We've all so I have that. a question for you. When it comes to um, your experience as a caddy, what is the difference between caddying for men versus women? Do you see kind of across the board as trends? Um, well, I would say for women, I love caddying for women because. I don't feel like there's enough ladies on the golf course, first of all. And we've kind of talked about this before, Allison, is that women, uh, they start golf, they realize how difficult it is, and sometimes they get left behind on the golf course, and so it makes them not really want to, you know, um, persevere through that and keep going. Because especially if you're the only lady in a group of and three men, it's like that's the foursome, and you're going out there, and you're left behind on your tee. People are walking past you while you're about to tee off, or you know you might not hit it as far as they do, so they're constantly like waiting on you. And if they aren't warm to you in that regard, it makes you just want to be like, oh, I'm not going to do this anymore because I don't feel like this is meant for me. This isn't, you know, structured towards me at all. Fashion for women is also difficult trying to find something for ladies that is flattering that you can wear on the golf course is difficult. So there's a lot of barriers in that regard. Um, and many companies are coming out now. It's becoming more normal to like get women involved in golf. Um, so I like catting for women because there's not nearly enough women. Also, I can relate to women and I, I love my colleagues and all the gentlemen I work with since I am the only female caddy at Pinehurst of 140 caddies or so. Um, I don't have anybody I can relate to in that caddy shack, um, which is fine because I'm a sailor's daughter and I like to do some trash talking and those caddies, <laughs> that all that we do in the caddy shack is we're just constantly giving each other a hard time about everything. And, and I feel like that's like camaraderie and it, and it's so wonderful to be part of that family and they have always been supportive, but then, you know, there are things that women can't talk about or, you know, late lady, like you don't talk about X, Y, and Z, and yet you're going through it or experiencing it alone. So then you can't share it. You can't, you know, like, you know, it's just a different, it's a different thing when it comes to ladies. That's why it would be nice if there was more lady caddies too, because we're all experiencing those things together and, and men cannot relate to, to that same thing. Now for men, caddying for men, as I said, I, I'm, an expert trash talker and I really enjoy the golf course because it's meant it's always meant as a way to bond it's not something that's a negative thing you you have no intention of offending anyone it's really just we're here to have a good time enjoy the game and make light of one of the hardest mental games on planet earth so I like to be a part of that and I like to also be an encouragement because a lot of men, you know, one of the things that worked for Lee Westwood, having his fiance on the bag, is because she kept him calm. 
And so that's not something like a male caddy is more likely to be, you know, emotionally reserved. You know, when something tough happens, they're going to shut their mouth and let the player cool off. Where a lady's going to say, you missed on the right side of the hole. This is an important thing to remember. You, you did, I told you to miss short and left. You didn't get on the green. That's okay. You missed short and left. You were short of the green. It's going to set us up for success. If you were on the right side, it would be a lot tougher. You know, I'm there to reassure the player that they're doing better than they think they are. It's like the mom of the foursome. <laughs> I am the caddy mom. I am the caddy mom. I, I have been known to sweep the floor in there a few times and tell people to pick up their stuff. <laughs> Does it, uh, does it annoy you that you're one of 140? I mean, that's quite a stat um, when, you, when you think about it. Of 140 people in, in any other profession, any other company, and I said, hey, I have, I have 140 employees and only one of them is a woman. What's and, wrong, Allison? And about that even bigger, right? Because you, have you ever met another woman caddy before? Because I've never in all of my years I, in golf. I have because of this weekend. So... Um, thankfully you guys asked me to come on the podcast Well, Sunday I will be doing an interview with, um, uh, golf magazine. And so I took it upon myself. There have been five other women before me at Pinehurst as caddies. And I reached out to them to hear their experiences. And that is the only reason I've met another lady caddy is because I reached out to them and it was so wonderful just and refreshing to just hear from you know people that have experienced what I experienced and and even laugh like we I was only kind of calling them to hear their experience we ended up staying on the phone for like an hour and a half and just talking about all of the things that came with like the nerves and not feeling like you're good enough but then realizing you were good enough and then it was like a marathon racer where you're just trying to constantly do better and do more and can I double loop with double bags can I can I go another seven miles? Can I do this? What is my body capable of? Um, so for me, uh, never being one of 40, one, one of 140 is not a problem for me. Um, I would rather there be more ladies that you know felt that confidence in themselves, but it takes more for us, I feel, to put ourselves out there and have the courage to do something like that. And uh, as much as I would love ladies to come out there, I'm okay with it as it is now. I just um, want to inspire other people so that, you know, the next generation that we're going to see, not based on quotas, but, you know, based on naturally occurring people realizing what they're capable of and going for something that they've never tried. So in preparing for this interview, I actually looked up how caddy is defined. Um, and it said someone who carries a player's bag and clubs and gives players advice and moral support. So my background is in sports psych, so I, you know, my ears like perked up. But I'm wondering how much of the time you've got on the course you actually dedicate to the mental side of golf instead of this is your line, this is your club. Um, I, like when you say mental side, do you, are you talking about like the player's mental part or mm -hmm. me course managing? The players, so more like calming nerves and getting them comfortable and refocusing and that kind of stuff. So funny enough, uh, I would say each person, it's all about the personalized experience uh, for me. And that's because uh, yesterday I had two players and one of the players, the more information I gave him, the better that he hit the ball, um, the better he made his putts, the more calm he was. My other player, I didn't even realize it until nine holes in and he is simplified. He has a very um, adaptive personality. And on the ninth hole, I realized that he needed a little bit of his own, you know, self-talk and more simple lines and more simple information, not all of the information in order to succeed. So on the 10th hole, I, I looked at him and I was like, I'm going to change my method with you. Um, and I apologize for the last nine holes because I didn't even realize it until now that you might prefer like a simplified version. He didn't know what I was talking about, but by the next two holes, he realized how my method change had helped him. I basically let him read all his putts and I said, what are you seeing here? And then when he told me, I either said, yes, you've got it, go for it, or just put it out a little further or it's the opposite side. It was one basic piece of information and I stepped off and he made the putt. And before I was giving him too much information and it was, you know, maybe clouding his, his ability to see the line or to actually execute the line. 
And um, something like that is just like, that's a, a, it's a really important part of the mental side of the game is knowing that one of my bags actually needed every single piece of information. Is the wind into us? Is it uphill by how much? And you know, oh, it's gonna come off the face of the club like this because you're on Bermuda and it's gonna catch on the grain. And like, maybe we should putt this instead of chip it. Like all these little detailed things where the other player, I basically, from then on, I allowed him to select his own club without recommending anything. I just gave him a simple number. And then um, I had him tell me what he was reading on his putts and only adjusted when he was off. And he started making everything. Yeah, I, I think it's fascinating how quickly caddies can pick up either cl by clubbing their, their players or by understanding their traits and how they learn, how they take in information, how they play uh, play the game. Because every every single golfer plays differently, thinks differently, and I think that's probably one of the most fascinating traits of a great caddy and somebody, and including yourself, who's only been doing this for several years, to even recognize that that is something that you need to to change and alter. Because just like in a game, I might have to alter the way I'm playing the course because either I suck or or things are going great and I don't want them to suck. Uh, whatever the case may be, you you have to change your approach to, to people as well because you've never met these people in your life until right then. And now they're trusting you and, and hoping that you can help them have the round of their life and the most the greatest experience that they can have on a course. That's a lot of pressure, but it sounds like you're, uh, you're killing it out there. So congrats and, and awesome. Um, and I remember when Allison came back from her trip, uh, the first thing she said back to us here at Stick and Hack was, you've got to meet Rose. She's amazing. Um, so it's really, really exciting and, uh, congratulations. You know, I know you're one of 140, but it sounds like you're one in a million in, uh, in a lot of ways. So, uh, congrats Thank to, you. to you on a uh, incredible start of your, of your, what we hope is a long career as a, as a caddy. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. It was a lot of fun and you're doing, it's just, it's amazing to hear you and your passion for golf. And I didn't even realize you had just started a few years ago. I mean, that is mind blowing. So well, all good things you for you. Thank you so much. And to everybody who's listening today, I would just, I would basically say, if you come to Pinehurst and you tell your caddy, I didn't come to Pinehurst to lay up. I just want you to think twice about what your caddy is telling you because they don't want you to lay up every time. They only want you to lay up on the ones where you're going to add strokes. And uh, it's course management. It's no offense to your game. Laying up is not always a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> Last thing, okay. So I, I'm just, I'm so glad that, we're, that you got to meet Rose and she was able to join us because it really was the most enjoyable round I've, I've had. Um, and with working with a caddy and it was, it was really, really awesome. Yeah. I, I loved her, her passion and her excitement uh, for her job and her career. Um, but her newfound passion for golf and, and how quickly, and this is a testament to the sport, right? How quickly you can go from Ugh, to, okay, this is awesome to, Oh, now I work in golf and, uh, and now I do this every day. It, it's, it's really, really exciting. But you know, I've had I've caddies before and uh, I'm I'm a simple man. This might might surprise you uh, and, and the listeners, but I, I'm a simple man when it comes to hey, just hit it at near, you know, around. I don't need a 146, 149 care. I don't need any of that crap. Just tell me how far do I need to hit it uh, within five yards, and I'll do my best. Um, and and that's that that having that skill on, on the course to to adapt quickly. Uh, she's learned that very very quickly in in, in a young career. So. Um, I'm glad that she was on the show, but, uh, more importantly, I'm glad you had an incredible golf experience with her because that you, it's something you remember and the don't lay up. I didn't come to Pinehurst lay up. I didn't come to wherever to lay up. Well, I didn't come there to spend $300 and shoot a 99 either. So, uh, what the hell are we talking about? That's exactly right. But people forget, right? It's like your ego gets in the way, which is why the mental stuff that she's doing is so important too. But, you know, caddies are such a, such a backbone to the game as a whole, and I, I love to walk. Um, don't love carrying my own bag necessarily, but I'm not, I'm not throwing two bags on my shoulders. I can tell you that for sure. But, you know, that's why it's so important to support your local caddy organization. So most state golf associations have a caddy program, um, and they need support. So, you know, while you're looking at what you're going to be doing with your charitable donations for the year, the chatty – chatty – Chatty Kathy over here. The Caddy Foundation programs are something that, that, you know, I hope people do take a look at because it is important and it would be a real shame if, if things trended differently and we lost that element of the game. 
Well, and get your kids involved and get, get uh, you know, start that at, at, a, at a young age um, and, and have them out there. And, and it will, just like anything, they'll either take to it or they won't, right? And, and so th there's, but to tell somebody, hey, you can make X amount of money uh, here or you can make X amount of money out there on the course, uh, for, for me, it, it seems, seems a very easy uh, decision. But there's a lot of scholarships that, that courses are doing um, for caddies. They, they are, they're, they're really trying to build these programs for the youth, for the game, and, and as well for their players themselves. So it's, I'm glad that it's not, that it's not dying. It, it's, a, it's a really cool uh, piece of the golf business. Absolutely. Well, thank you to everyone for joining us here at the Business of Golf on the Stick and Hack Network. And remember to tick, tip your caddy as well. They're working hard, and they're definitely a really important part of the game.